happy to be here this morning. Uh, I thought I would uh, start by um, introducing uh, just a little video that we put together for uh, our newest location, which opens in uh, 12 days in West Loop, Chicago. So I like to start off a little bit talking about um, you know, a philosophy and approach that we take to, uh, to what we do every day. And it's um, when I let go of what I am, I become what I might be. And the reason we talk about that um, associated with Punchbowl Social is that uh, you know, we are a disruptive brand within the restaurant category. So. Um, we are taking market share from some of my friends out here in casual dining um, through experiential food and beverage. So we have uh, changed the category to, uh, to a degree or the definition of what a restaurant is. Um, you know, and it, it's, it, it's interesting, the way, you know, the way that our approach is, which, you know, again, speaks to um, our, our quote here is that if we think about the great talk that Nolan Bushnell gave last night, um, you know, from Chuck E. Cheese, right? He, he, he's the founder of the feast. He started uh, this entertainment movement, which by the way, I will pay $50 to anyone that could come up with a better name for our category than entertainment. But for, for now, I think we're all stuck with it. Um, but you know, the way Nolan approached uh, the world is that he was using technology um, really to drive um, some food and beverage traffic, um, but not on the same ratios that we do. So Punchable Social uses these social gaming elements um, to drive what, uh, from a ratio standpoint, is 89% food and beverage versus 11% gaming. And um, that's, no small, um, that's no small trick, and it's, it is very much differentiated within the same category of what Nolan started many, um, many years ago. Um, so to the um, to the concept model itself, uh, excuse me, I, I'll get in trouble if I don't if I don't mention this from our PR uh, group. We found out last week that we um, uh, were honored uh, by Fast Company uh, as one of the most innovative uh, companies in the world. Um, some you know, 36 not very smart editors got together and chose us as as one of those brands. Um, we're a little shocked, but we're still very much uh, proud to be associated with uh, some of the companies that are listed uh, that are listed there. So um, then we get to our concept model of what Punchbowl Social is. So for those of you that don't know what what a Punchbowl Social is, we are, you know, the, the concept model is made up of large format, 20 to 27,000 square feet, uh, dirty modern design, which consists of Mountain Lodge. Uh, mid-century modern, industrial, and Victorian. Sounds uh, peculiar when you, when you put it together, but just like a platypus, it has a place in nature. Um, and uh, you know, until you see a platypus moving around in its natural environment, you don't know what the hell he does, but Punchbowl is very similar. You just gotta come to a Punchbowl social to understand what it is, which is a little bit of why we say, um, we don't have time to explain, just get in the car. You'll figure it out when you get there. Uh, we have a modular layout which uh, is conducive for private parties. Um, we are able to uh, drive approximately 30% of our sales uh, from corporate and social traffic and the rest is a la carte um, business. 
we modulate this in a way so that uh, we, we don't alienate that walk-in traffic while we're having multiple private events going on at the same time. Some of our friends and uh, competitors within the category uh, have uh, as much as 50% of their uh, aggregate sales come from the private event side. We think that's too high within our model um, because our bread and butter is still the man and the woman off the street for a la carte sales. Um, if you look at the way that we market and you look at the materials that we put together, we're very much a brand that is millennial oriented. Um, we, I think Inc. Magazine called us the millennial whisperers, um, which was um, funny, but so uh, we, we like a good laugh. Then, you know, if you are going to market to millennials, uh, you better damn well make sure that you are authentic. They will sniff it out um, a mile away, uh, and they will not only sniff it out, um, but they will tell 10 million of their best friends that you are not authentic and to never show up there. Uh, and, then, and then we approach this whole thing. Um, we, we try to with a timelessness to it. So in our designs, we... we um, you know, it's, it's part of what uh, gets us up in the morning, makes our socks roll up and down. Um, but uh, we never want to be limited by a certain era, right? So we think about our brand as, um, uh, as being timeless. The, uh, you know, our brand DNA, uh, there are these three major components, of course, social gaming, scratch kitchen, uh, and craft beverages. Um, you know, we, we put all this together again in a design forward environment. Um, and I'll speak a little bit uh, further about how, um, how all that comes together. Uh, our, uh, our culinary partner, a friend of mine named uh, Hugh Atchison, some of you may be familiar with him. He um, is a multi James Beard Award winner, uh, he's been a, a, a judge on Top Chef. But um, a few years after we had already, uh, we were already in operations, we asked him to come in and help us engineer a little bit better, get more efficient in the kitchen, um, while still not changing our philosophy towards scratch kitchen. We are a diner-inspired scratch kitchen. Everything in our kitchen is brought in in raw ingredients, and we make it and we serve it to the guests. And you see some items here, um, you know, a, a lobster roll. We do a chicken and waffle that is a bucket of a... Uh, OMFGGF um, Southern Fried Chicken. For those of you that don't speak um, Twitter, um, that's oh my fucking god, uh, gluten free fried chicken. So <laughs> don't don't tell your children what that means when they come in. Or actually, they may tell you. That's actually the funny thing. Uh, so from a, a, a beverage standpoint, it's all craft. Um, we uh, both from from a cocktail standpoint and what we do with non-alcoholic. We do focus on millennials. Millennials nominally drink less um, than, than, than my Gen X um, generation and certainly the generation that was uh, before me who I think are still drunk and have been drunk for like 40 years. <laughs> um, so we put a lot of attention and, uh, and interest into making craft non-alcoholic beverages. And millennials, while they don't drink as much, they're not, you know, they're not drinking Coca-Cola. Okay, they're still, they want a craft experience. And uh, so uh, we put a lot of effort into that um, for them. Social spaces, uh, you know, again, large format, 20 to 27,000 square feet. Um, barcade elements, boutique bowling. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, we try to create as many Instagrammable locations as possible so that you can share um, your experience with uh, everybody in your synthetic digital network. Um, uh, this, this, this slide sort of scares the hell out of me uh, as I look at it, but uh, it, it really brings it all home of all the work that we've been doing over the last six years for this company. Um, open locations, you'll see Rancho Cucamonga, Sacramento, Portland, Denver, Stapleton, Minneapolis, Indianapolis, Schaumburg, Detroit, and Cleveland, and Austin. Um, deals that we're working on now will open five this year. Uh, San Diego, uh, Chicago, Arlington, Brooklyn, uh, Dallas, and Atlanta. Um, and uh, then we have these other deals that we're negotiating. So we do uh, have a plan to um, sort of take advantage of what, um, and I say this with as much humility as, as, as possible, um, we are best in class within the entertainment category. Uh, and our goal from a business standpoint is to become dominant in class. Um, and one can set up the other. 
Uh, so what, you know, that was an introduction into, into who we are, but we want to talk about adaptive uh, reuse and why it works for us. And here's some examples of some great adaptive reuse projects around the country. This is a formal mental institution in New York. It's now a boutique hotel called the Henry. Uh, this is a former sugar refinery um, turned into a rock climbing gym in, uh, in Montreal, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then this is a form of gasification plant. That's actually a real word, I promise. We looked it up over and over, hoping it wasn't a real word. Um, and uh, this is a great public uh, park um, in, uh, in Seattle. So why do we do it? Um, you know, for, for Punchbowl Social, one, it, again, you know, design is, is, is what makes our socks roll up and down independently. Um, so this provides a better design inspiration for us. Uh, it also invigorates the community, which is, uh, uh, which is critical to the way that we approach our relationship with our consumer. Um, it's consistent with the green initiative they have in this company. We, you know, we serve paper straws, paper napkins. We don't do uh, serve anything in bottles, um, only draft beers and cans. Um, you know, anything that we can find ways to do to lower our carbon footprint uh, is, uh, is critical uh, to our, uh, our corporate uh, mission. Um, clearly, it creates market differentiation when you can do these unique um, alternative projects. Um, and then something I'm talking about again in a minute is that the annual the annual return on invested capital um, on these deals uh, is similar to what we've been able to generate uh, in, uh, in these lifestyle centers around the country. And there's some really great lifestyle centers. You guys all know that. Um, but I want to talk about why, it's, why it's, uh, it's helpful to look at it from this alternative perspective. Um, and then for us, our goal is to become an iconic American brand. We talk about that every day. You can believe it. You can not believe it. Um, inside of our organization, we, we, we do, and, um, and, and everything in this company goes through a lens uh, that speaks to how we manage and curate brand and what steps can we take to become an iconic American brand. This is the original uh, Denver uh, location. You can just see sort of what we were able to do with this space. This originally was a was a big lot uh, that we were able to um, convert uh, into a punch pull social. Uh, it, you know, in this slide, you can see, uh, I'll show you a little bit about how uh, we program a punch bowl. So this is the front door right here. Uh, as you come in, and at every punch bowl social, we force you to walk through uh, our diner component, which is the traditional seating. You walk up to um, uh, the host or hostess here. Uh, and they will take you over here or over here in a controlled environment. This is a uh, traditional diner uh, breakfast counter. This is an open kitchen here. So as you walk into a Punchbowl Social, everyone knows that you can come in, you can go over here, you can get a great craft beverage experience, you can start bowling, you can play bocce. We have VR lounges uh, that we just institution, instituted as, uh, as part of our gaming program. Uh, and then over here, you can see there's some separate bowling lanes, once again, so that we can modulate different events within, uh, within the space and still service this a la carte traffic that comes in off the street. There's a mezzanine in this location. There's another bar up here. These are um, uh, old school uh, video games. I wish Mr. Nolan were here to tell me that he did it better than we are doing it. But um, uh, you'll have to take my word that that's, I'm sure, what he believes. Uh, ours still only cost a quarter, and um, uh, you know uh, we don't make a ton of money on them. But of course, it, it creates what we call, um, or what we all call, the um, um, dwell time. So, punchable social has significant dwell time. Um, we refer to it as sticky factor, right? You get into a punchable social, you think you're coming in for 30 minutes, three and a half hours later, you leave, and you know, and the contents of your wallet um, while you were. So um, the Baker neighborhood is where this was originally located. Again, as a former big lots, um, we did save this building from, oops, you can't go back apparently on this, but take my word for it. There's a building somewhere in that picture we were just looking at. And um, we saved it from becoming an auto body shop. Um, the neighborhood didn't need that. Once we opened up uh, in the Baker neighborhood at First and Broadway, um, the first year we were open, the other businesses, restaurants, and retailers also experienced the 20% lift 
uh, in their sales once Punchbowl Social entered. Um, and um, real estate values uh, since we first opened have increased um, more than 100%. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a boom to, uh, to that economy. Uh, this is the former air traffic control tower, which is a really exciting one. We opened it back in November. Um, this was, uh, had been abandoned for 23 years. Um, uh, you know, it's the last assembled bricks of the old airport before we moved it out to DIA. Uh, and the city of Denver approached us and said, um, you know, this thing is going to get torn down. We can't figure out what to do with it. Would you consider turning it into a punchbowl social? I said, yes. Um, and then a year later, after understanding how the, the budget issues, I still said yes, <laughs> just a little more quietly. Um, but, uh, but this is a real, um, th this project helped create a lot of brand equity for us, um, that, that we would take on something like this and save a Colorado icon. Um, so this was the original structure you see right here, and the tower itself that goes up. We expanded it into these areas. Uh, to create 16,000 square feet of indoor space, which is smaller than the typical punch bowl. However, we did also develop 14,000 square feet of outdoor space, which has a beer garden, a fake swimming pool. You'll have to come see it to understand what that means. Um, ping pong tables uh, and some flex space over here for, uh, for private events. This is a, just a quick little time lapse video to show you sort of what it went through. So our design inspiration here uh, was that we, uh, you know, we really wanted to celebrate the uh, the golden era of flight. So we went back and we, uh, you know, uh, researched a lot of old TWA and Pan Am ads and uh, just sort of that again, that whole spirit of when flight was sexy as opposed to what we get crammed into these, you know, 14 square inch seats on Frontier Airlines from time to time. Um, and uh, just helped, you know, tried to help remember when it was a cool thing to do to, to go fly. Um, that's the finished product. You know, this is, um, this is this thing at night. It's the first time this tower has been lit up in 23 years. We've been very proud of how, uh, how this came together for us. Um, another project that we, um, we opened this June is uh, in San Diego in um, the um, um, East Village. Uh, this is an old historic uh, boxing coliseum. I think some, uh, I think Archie Moore actually had some heavyweight fights here, which is kind of neat. We were able to get our hands on it, and we're converting this thing into a punchbowl social. A little bit more about the neighborhood here and how vibrant it is and what it's going to become. Right now, I think the current resident in East Village or in this portion of it are pigeons. Um, so we're, um, we're not really going to displace them. We're going to figure out how to live with them. Um, these guys are actually our bruisers. They're going to help drive the pigeons out, though, if, we, if it does get bad. <laughs> I don't know why they become pugilists and are going at it there. Um, and this will be the finished product. Last uh, but not least is uh, we're doing this foundry project in, um, uh, in St. Louis. It was an old historic foundry. Um, uh, you know, th this thing is... Um, is, is this uh, sort of section right here in St. Louis. They are, well, there is gonna be a food hall component to this. Um, and I think there's gonna be an Alamo draft house and of course a punchable social. Um, and then we did get this sign right here, which uh, crosses, I think, Interstate 78, I, I can't recall, but so it's gonna be pretty neat to have, a, you know, when you, when you engage in these kind of projects, you get lucky enough to get signage like this on the, on the freeways. And so, Look, uh, for us, the future of Punchable Social is, um, you know, we are a lifestyle brand, and we're going to make some pivots into lifestyle brand orientation. So there's a conventional Punchable Social. We are working on um, Punchable so the first Punchable Social Hotel, which will be a true experiential boutique um, hotel experience. So you will be able to get all of the experiential elements off of our experience platform. 
at Punchbowl Social within the hotel. And then separately, we're working on a social club uh, element that will be um, oriented uh, for millennials. And uh, you know, and our look, our connective tissue here is that uh, is the authenticity and the experience platform. If we can take those things and transport them into another business vertical, we, we'll be able to. And we love that being able to cross over that gray space between a conventional punchable social and a hotel. Um, we uh, we also find ourselves with some marketing alignments with other um, lifestyle brands that we have a lot of respect for. Um, one of my favorite brands is Shinola. Um, we've entered into this arrangement with Shinola where we are going to take a Shinola bike and we're going to put them in all of the punch bowls. Uh, and uh, it will create a uh, bicycle uh, pedal uh, cell phone charging station. So you'll be able to charge your cell phone off the grid by sitting down and, and pedaling for a little bit. But the cool part about it is that you're actually, when you plug into it, you're not going to plug into the power that you create. You're going to plug into the power that three riders before you created that are stored in this battery, and then you'll. So, and then we just ask you to do a little bit of riding to help out. But these are elements of uh, our by lifestyle orientation. We know that these are things taking power off the grid is something that our consumer deeply appreciates and resonates with them. Um, you know, as I get to the thesis here of, of this talk. You know, I, 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 I can't tell you how to grow your business or how to iterate it, but what I can do is I can share you how we went through the mental process of, of growing and iterating our brand, and you can find your own story um, inside of that. We, from, from a business standpoint, everything has to still, we're still in the profit-making business, right? All these cool things that we do have to connect to um, creating shareholder value. If we can't do that, you know, we're not taking care of our families, we're not taking care of the, of the individuals and institutions that trusted us to write checks to help us grow these brands. And so the way that we think about doing these adaptive reuse projects is through our holy grail, which is annualized return on invested capital. Okay, so when we can focus on driving the appropriate ROIC, um, while not taking landlord TA dollars, okay, that, that's an important equation that allows us to get around the, the need to, to inject more capex into each one of these projects. So it, it, it's a pulling mechanism. So of course, if you're gonna take less TA, you're gonna get a better rent economic, okay? And it does require you to put more capital into your deal, but your gross margins are gonna be better as a result of lower occupancy costs. Um, by doing this, and so, you know, it, again, even if your initial investment is challenged, um, you're going to end up with, with with better gross margin, and you're going to have a better product. And for for us, we can't become an America, a, a iconic American brand by doing the same deals over and over, taking large amounts of TA in these projects from landlords that can afford it. These smaller landlords that own co coliseums and and airports. They, they just don't have the liquidity uh, to do it. Either that or they need us to put up some type of you know, credit element to it to help them borrow, um, uh, which, which is a challenge because if we're gonna take that kind of risk, we'd rather just put the money in ourselves rather than bank their bank. So look, as you're walking around the world and you're trying to do these deals, you're not gonna find Simon with a, an abandoned airport. You're not gonna find GGP doing coliseums and Westfield is not gonna have any kind of foundries. Nothing against those groups. They're wonderful REITs. They put together tremendous retail projects. But if you wanna think outside of the box and you wanna find a way to do some of these things, you know, you're gonna to have to look at other alternative means. And for us, it means annual return on invested capital, right? If we can get to that, we can justify all kinds of other things that are below that line. And that brings us back to our quote, right? So we don't forget this, you know, when I let go of what I am, I can become what I might be. And for us, as a restaurant that is pivoting into lifestyle brand orientation, we're trying to become an iconic American brand, and we always end all of our meetings with saying we're going to the Restaurant Hall of Fame. And we're not gonna do any of that unless we think outside of the box and try to become something other than what we think we are today. And that's why we say we don't have time to explain, get in the car, right? That's what we did. We knew if we got in the car and we had belief that we could help navigate that car to a special place, we were gonna get there. And that's what we did. It's been our motto. That's us. <laughs>